Good evening and welcome to the Centre for Applied Theology and this uh, additional conversation as it uh, um, arises from the topic of icons and praying at home that we undertook as part of the series on uh, a pastoral response to COVID-19. We have with us tonight Deacon Michael Lomax, who is a Russian Orthodox deacon based in Brussels, as well as uh, a guest, uh, Dr. Elena Naranskaya, who will be assisting us as we as we engage in this discussion around icons, because there was so much more to discuss after our uh, after our first evening together. So, uh, Patricia, I'll ask if you would uh, start us off with the uh, first question for for Deacon Michael. Our first question um, is about how we describe the production of icons. At our, our former session, we spoke about writing icons as opposed to painting them. Maybe the word writing has implications for how an icon is produced that painting doesn't actually have. Um, we understand that, that Dick and Michael would like to speak about this. Um, what would you like to say, Michael? We're very interested to know. Okay, really, I don't want to spend too much time on this. In a sense, it's an extremely secondary item. And I speak now as a professional linguist, quite simply to say to write an icon is, excuse me, a linguistic stupidity. Where does it come from? from the fact that the Russian language uses the same word, pisat, for to write and to paint artistically. There are two other words for painting in Russian. One, risovat, for technical drawing, and krasi, for applying paint on an image. But quite simply, normal um, artistic painting um, I see no reason why we can't use the, the very normal word of um, to paint. I, say, I could ask simply, did Rubens or Van Dyck or Jordans write their paintings? Of course not. They painted them. So did the Russian painters, Nesterov, Kramskoy, Ivanov, or again Russian icon painters, Rublev, Dionysius, or Simon Wyshakov. In a sense, <laughs> Excuse me saying this, so it's one of these, for me, it's one of these slightly pious affectations, which too often surrounds orthodoxy, that sort of special language people use, like Easter suddenly becomes Pascha. You no longer die, but you repose. It's all a bit affected and really totally unnecessary. Um, and basically our own students, because as you know, my wife teaches iconography, and as to her, I owe almost my entire knowledge of iconography. Um, in our own icon painting studio, we just tell people it's to write and that's it. Sorry, but, but it's to, it, it, we tell them that it is to paint. Uh, in French, vous peignez, vous n'écrivez pas. And voila, that's it. Um, there's, simply, there's no linguistic justification for making the differentiation. Thank you. Elena. Thank you very much, Deacon Michael. Um, it was quite an interesting question to ponder about the writing and 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 painting. And um, in pondering it um, earlier on, I was thinking that's also for the sailors relevant. They don't swim on the boat; they often walk on the boat, or or mm. those this, this particular. Um, genre in language that they use and and to a certain extent it possibly elevates their vocation and and i was thinking as long as the um definitions don't lose the depth and the meaning it it really doesn't matter what word we use so in this i i really agree with deacon um michael about uh, the not mutual exclusivity of the word and and my second our second question is um, we talked about the materials used in the creation of icons as somehow embodying creation in a symbolic way. Is this something you accept? Or do you think it is an overly pious interpretation of the process of icons? I, again, for me, this falls into the category of 
Okay, if it makes you happy, I'm not going to stop you. But what this, why I dislike it is all this sort of chatter quickly draws attention away from the essential questions. These revolve around, what is the icon there to do? What purpose is it intended to serve? And in particular, what is it that makes an icon work and not work? You know, this is the kerygma. Let's get this right and most of the rest will follow and fall into place. Um, as if you've read the foreword to my wife's book, The Icon, Truth and Fable, um, you'll have, she does a brilliant send up of um, this sort of chatter and trying to find symbols and everything. And indeed, um, you, if you want to, you can devise this sort of symbolic explanation or justification for just about any activity. I am also a hobby carpenter, and I could make up the same sort of um, symbolism for carpentry. And probably I could do it uh, for day-to-day -day works like cooking or doing the dishes. Yes, if you want, but let's please stay to essentially what an icon is and how it works and the proper way of painting it. Okay, you know, that's my line of it. So um, tell us uh, something about icons and perspective. I mean, uh, it has been said, uh, as I'm sure you know, and including by us in our discussion the other night, that the perspective represented in an icon can serve to draw people in. Um, yet I think you've suggested that in this respect, icons don't necessarily differ from other images from the period in which their style developed. So can you first say a little bit about the period in which they developed and then say something about perspective? Okay, let me start by saying that the development of icons is a continuous process pretty much right through the history of the Christian church, starting as early as the second century and actually taking over without interruption from pagan art. In terms of periods, we can, if we want, divide icon painting very roughly into four periods. Pre-Byzantine, number two, Byzantine or medieval, number three, academic, and four, post-academic. The second and the third, Byzantine and academic, give their name to specific approaches, Byzantine and academic. And note that I use the word approach rather than style. We find it works better because, in a sense, and a word like Byzantine or academic, in fact, covers a whole range of styles. If you like, the Byzantine approach is essentially what came before the Renaissance. Not, re not necessarily realistic as we understand realism today, but with its own and very strong demands in terms of proportion, light, lighting, and across the board, a constant search for balance, beauty, and realism as they understood it. What then happened we go on to academis, academism or academic painting. This is where this search for realism ultimately led to different speeds and different cultures. Um, in Greece first, then Italy, and then quite a long time afterwards in Russia. And in most of Western art, academic realism reached its apex in about the early 19th century. And it, then it basically hit the buffers. It was unable to go any further in terms of reproduction of what we call the retinal image and was gradually being challenged by photography. So inevitably in much of Europe, artists then went looking for ways of achieving further expressiveness. Um, and in many cases, revisiting pre-academic styles. This, for example, gave the Gothic revival in architecture and in painting in England. Now in Russia, 
icon painting moved from the medieval approach to the ac academic approach late, only in the 18th century. And some would argue they never quite got it into their system. And it was only as late as the 20th century that Russia rediscovered medieval art. Most of it in extremely bad condition in the churches under layers of overpainting and they started to restore it. And actually most of the best recovery and restoration work took place in the first 20 years of communist rule. Now, outside of Russia, this recovery of pre-academic styles, what in England we would tend to refer to as the Gothic Revival, occurred with relatively little noise. Uh, people took over medieval approaches to perspective lighting comp composition without any real need to develop a special theology or special philosophy. Um, in Russia, contrary to this and for some reason, the rediscovery of medieval art launched an avalanche of theological debate and speculation of very varied quality, which was continued after 1917, particularly in the parish emigration, not always by the most professional and most capable people. Now, when the churches reopened in Russia in the 1990s, and there was this massive need to restore churches and to have new icons, the general consensus was that the medieval approach was correct or the best one, and for some the only viable approach, as somehow being more holy, more Russian, and a common argument less passionate than the academic style. Uh, these were viewpoints strongly, which had been strongly upheld by Russian icon painters outside Russia, and particularly those grouped around Leonid Uspensky, you may have heard the name, who wrote this book about 40 years ago, The Theology of the Icon. Um, uh, I'm not mentioned too much about that book at the moment, other than to say we think it's a disaster. But certainly it is this medieval approach that most would-be icon painters want to learn. It's for, to learn this approach they come to our academy and it, that is what my wife teaches. Um, now perspective and drawing people in. Let me put it this way. In real medieval icons painted by me in medieval days perspective was not an issue. And there is no attempt to create a special perspective for icons that differs from the perspective or the lack of it anywhere else. It is only today, after 300 years of academic painting, that we notice the difference in the treatment of perspective between icons and other paintings. In fact, using academic painting as our norm. It may be indeed that for some people who are accustomed to, to look at paintings with their eyes trained by academic painting, that this so-called reverse perspective does indeed have a drawing in effect, maybe. But it was certainly not the intention of the medieval painters. And therefore, you know, let's please not make a theology out of it. Let's also notice that actually reverse perspective is only a very small part of the perspectives used in an icon and in fact it's just about impossible to paint an icon with them completely in it, it just doesn't work. Okay that's good, that's over to you. Thank you for that. Elena did you want to uh, move us on to the next question? Yes, um... You've mentioned your wife and her comments on what we might call the mythology of iconography, especially as it has developed in the, um, the book of um, 
Uspensky, the theology of icons. Um, on top of um, what you've already told us about, what are some of the additional ideas about icons um, that um, you would like to bring across and uh, uh, hold uh, particularly important for yourself? If you like, first of all, let, let, let me hit more the second part of your question, which will pretty much answer the first. I think there are two things I really want to um, mention. The first is our belief, um, and it's a pretty strong one, that it is wrong to see icon painting as separate from the general stream of Christian art. It is part of a wider sweep, and it's extremely difficult in hard history actually to draw boundaries. And for us, it is part and parcel of a single whole to which the general rules of aesthetics and of art theory apply as they do anywhere else. Uh, there is no special aesthetics uh, for icon painting, essentially. Um, now, and a major problem we have is when people start to philosophize or theologize on icon painting and on Christian religious art in general, is we notice the absence of trained art historians and theoreticians in the debate. Um, and if I can come, I say, all of you have a more academic background than I do, but as I understand it, much of what we teach as theology borrows heavily from other disciplines. Um, theology involves deeply history, it involves linguistics, it involves psychology, um, human anthropology. And if we are to be good theologians, we have to listen carefully to and learn from the experts in these adjacent fields. We mustn't go off amateurishly uh, on our own. Um, and this is precisely why, where for us, the theology of the icon by Uspensky went wrong. Actually, Uspensky had little training as an artist and absolutely zero in art theory. Um, and in fact, my wife pointed out to me, uh, I don't know if you know the name Hans Belting, who is a top European art theoretician and culturologist. He wrote a book, what, 20 years ago called Image and Cult, Built and Cult. Um, actually, this, this is the Russian version of it, my wife has handed me, um, Obras y Cult. Um, and actually, he completely bypasses Russian medieval art. And he says he does so on purpose. He says that it is an area so totally spoiled by cliches that he, which he neither wants to take over or simply waste his time fighting. And then the second point, I think it's extremely important, and particularly in respect of portrait icon painting as distinct from narrative. If we, we have to pose the question, if in painting Christ or the mother of God or the saints, we are seeking to use art to convey the essence of holiness, what is it that makes this process work? What Christian artwork works here and what does not? Or to, perhaps to put it another way around, you've got a young trainee priest who's going to be responsible for a uh, congregation, for a parish. Um, how do we teach him to sense when an icon or religious painting, or indeed a statue or stained glass, if placed in his church, will bring people closer to God? Or when it will it fail, or perhaps even repel them? Now, I, I remember coming back to the original conversation, Sister Francisca, uh, mentioned the fact 
that not everything that calls itself an icon uh, brings people to God. And some can be pretty repulsive. Um, actually, I would add that before Uspensi came out with his theology of the icon, what made or did not make a good icon was never really a problem. People worked this out based on a basic sense of good taste and anthropological finesse when they were called to judge whether to have an icon or not. It is Uspensky who totally muddied the waters with his dogma, which is basically put at its simplest, medieval is good, academic bad. bad. Uh, I don't know if you remember the phrase in Orwell's um, Animal Farm. Uh, what was it? Two, uh, legs two legs good, four legs bad. And it's, it's basically medieval good, academic bad. Now, this is an infuriating area. What is good, what is bad, especially if you're a dogmatic theologian like me who likes something nice and clear. Simply, there are no cut and dry answers. Um, Ultimately, what makes an icon good or bad, the sense of it is more an appeal to tradition and artistic sensitivity to any, than to any hard and fast rules. What one is looking for in an icon, in particular, is a sense of balance and the portrayal of inner beauty. An icon painter who fails to master of the craft of an artist and lacks artistic sensitivity and that almost certainly will condemn the work before he's even started. Um, if, and if an icon painter opts for a medieval approach they must do so for a clear artistic reason. If it's just medieval for the sake of medieval it will be dead and useless. And in this context, quite simply, the artist's own spiritual development, where they are on their journey towards God, is important. And indeed, for many, learning icon painting is a critical com component of their spiritual development. I would say an icon painter, to do it properly, needs that mixture of spiritual and artistic sensitivity to produce a figure and a face that are clean, pure, balanced, something which, if you like, put quite simply, God can use to speak through it to the person standing in front of it and this person to God. In other words, it becomes a tool for a sort of two-way uh, communication. Um, and I must address here one mistake which underlies a lot a bad icon painting today. The idea that an icon must somehow dehumanize or superhumanize, transfigure, in order not to run the danger of the passions. Put it crudely, uh, it mustn't sexually excite or otherwise uh, lead our thoughts astray. Um, on the other hand, quite simply, we must not forget Christ came to us in human form. His mother was a woman in normal female format. The saints were all human beings. Yes, if you paint human figures, especially younger ones, you face the question of sexual attractiveness. But the saints overcame their passions and their faces and body poses even, if, even when quite young, no doubt reflected this, but they remained men and women of flesh and blood. And for us, the, 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 there is just no reason to paint them otherwise. There's, there must be no sort of fleeing away from body, bodiness. Okay, I've gone on a bit. So, right, I think we have one more uh, question, uh, mm -hmm. which I'll ask uh, um, Patricia to pose. Deacon Michael, what do you think of prayer corners in homes? 
Um, there are more um, elaborate ones. James showed us some um, pictures when we were talking about this before. And there are simpler ones. What, what do you feel about this? What opportunities do they offer? And what pitfalls might they represent? I think this is a very, very personal matter. And I have to say, I have little experience of prayer corners in family homes. You know, I've not been in a situation, particularly of having children, you know, sort of gathering people towards a prayer corner. And frankly, I pray in one corner, my wife in the other. Um, and also, why is it, while it is quite normal for Orthodox to have a discreet icon or two in their living room or in the kitchen, very much as, as uh, Catholics may have a crucifix or Protestants a simple cross, I suspect that most people who pray seriously have their prayer desk somewhere away from public view, in an office or a bedroom or wherever. And I say prayer desk rather than prayer corner for a reason, because quite simply to pray properly uh, requires you to have, certainly in the Orthodox tradition, to, to be juggling with several books, unless you're doing pure extemporary prayer, you know, a prayer book, a Psalter, a Bible. Um, you know, I've probably got about, juggling about four or five on my prayer desk. Uh, the rest, particularly on the wall, icons, crosses, prayer ribs, and whatever, just very much a matter of personal taste. Though I do suspect that many of the icon corners that were shown on our previous program were those of neophytes, people fairly early on in the process. There were too many icons, they were too random and not personal enough. Um, actually myself, I do it slightly differently. I'm very fortunate being the husband of an icon painter that I have from it, behind my prayer desk what is basically rather like a medieval triptych. The central figure is a what we call a deusis, that is Christ the mother of God and John the Baptist. And at least for me importantly, with the Christ figure at eye level and large enough, so basically I'm face to face with him. And you know, how many times when the going has been rough, have I just literally just stood in front of that figure of Christ? It's, it's my way of just going to very straight and sometimes quite hard dialogue with him. On the rest of the, um, on the two wings of the icons, on the left I got five English saints, including Julian of Norwich with her cat. On the right hand panel are five Russian saints, along with Seraphim Sarov and his bear. Now, what they say to each other when I'm away, <laughs> don't ask. <laughs> but I imagine it's quite amusing. Okay. That's great, thank you very much. Um, Elena, I know you, you had some thoughts that you wanted to uh, pose. Now, at this point, just so you all know, um, we could include some of what's discussed in a video. So I'm going to let it keep recording. But uh, if things are a mess and people aren't comfortable, editing is easily done. So uh, okay, fine. Okay. Keep talking, uh, Elena. Did you you had uh, a few thoughts you wanted to raise? Uh, you think you're unleashing a bear of St. Seraphim of Sorrow? <laughs> but he was a nice, <laughs> kind bear, wasn't he? <laughs> um, oh, thank you very much, Deacon Michael, for quite an alternative view uh, to a theological discussion. And it was quite interesting because um, we usually tend to be comfortable in our own circles. And often when I organize events, I, I like to bring people with different opinions and I would celebrate different opinions because in a way being part of an Abrahamic Jewish Christian um, Muslim dialogue, that's my professional theological training, I've learned that by hearing a different opinion, you refine your own and mm -hmm. it's the greatest help for theological process for an intellectual process but most of all in the religious encounter or in personal journey you discover more of yourself the the opponent is helpful especially with a different opinion to to 
to draw you to yourself, to your own gut, to your own heart, to your own principles and convictions. So I thank you so much for giving this opportunity to me. And while, while you were expressing your opinion, I was thinking, how interesting theologizing about anything. And as a trained theologian, I would not dare ever call myself a theologian or an artist or any pompous with a big capital, but I've been trained quite heavily in theology. And that allows me to apply this tool, to apply this methodology, to apply this way of thinking to anything, be it food, be it coronavirus, be it love and relationships, be it icons or the church or the other person. And in a way, I wouldn't say that theologizing about the icons would, would be the only way of thinking about the icon, the only right or wrong. This is not applicable. What I'm saying is that as a trained, as a trained theologian, I am well equipped to think theologically about anything. So in this way, I am sort of allowing myself to give a theology of an icon uh, if it is helpful in my personal journey or in educational discovery. However, I would never suggest that theology of the icon is the only way. It's an art, it's a form of ecclesiastical expression. Um, it, it is also an educational tool because I think in the time when not everybody was literal and not everybody had access to written texts, which are quite important for, for liturgical expression of the Orthodox Church, when people entered the churches and were surrounded by the lives of the saints or by the daises or by um, pictures, powerful images of Christ staring at them, almost judging, or the scenes, the, usually when you enter the Orthodox Church, there is a... Uh, um, uh, Last Supper at the front, where Christ is with his um, disciples, sharing the last meal, inviting everybody else to the Eucharist, and there is often a judgment at the back. So the people are rejoicing and yet testing themselves at the same time. And then the, the saints are, I loved the image of what they do when we are away. Uh, it's quite interesting, we don't know that, but we have this powerful presence of uh, pillars of the church, not just the Byzantine pillars of architectural structure of the church, but those saints who are the foundation um, of, 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 of our Orthodox living tradition. So just, um, I'm allowing myself to theologize about icons and I would celebrate the process but also in the light of iconography being a living tradition and orthodoxy being a living tradition. That means that if we want to keep it alive, we have to digest it one way or another. We have to take in whatever it um, gives us, but we have to give it back in the way like we inhale and exhale. Um, Apologies for getting too much into the, the symbolism of the process, but um, I'm, I, I'm very thankful for uh, igniting this um, feedback in me. And um, thank you once again. Good. Thank you. Um, Patricia, did you have anything you wanted to um, follow through with? Not really, no. Um, I mean, I found it, like Elena said, it was all very interesting um, to hear a different approach, um, a different way of looking at icons is, again, it's, it's very enriching and um, makes one think. 
Um, that's really all I have to say. All right. Are you uh, happy with everything, uh, Deacon Michael, or is there anything you want to uh, close us off with? Um, really, a couple of things. I was um, coming, if I can just come back to Dr. Nanskaya, um, it was this idea of bringing in and taking out. Um, it is, if you like, it is precisely, I think, the this process that um, we have tried to address because basically we've, we felt that quite simply Paris got it wrong, that Uspensky made, sorry, made a mess of it and did a lot of damage to icon painting. And for, for us, when we wrote this book, The Icon Truth and Fables, uh, this is the, um, yeah, this is how it looks in published form. Um, you know, we, we, it, it was quite a theological exercise for us. Uh, and it's a bit scaring when you, when you pull apart um, or you question the doctrine um, of a fairly important part of the church, and ones which has certainly made a lot of noise about itself. Um, my wife asked me, to uh, mention a couple of her publications. The first of it is um, a book called um, the An Attempt um, of an Introduction into Christian uh, Art. Theory of Art. Christian Theory of Art. It, in a published version, it's only in Russian. Um, that is Oput Vedenia, the Christianstwo is Gustu Znania. We um, My wife says that whereas Icon and Fables is um, apophatic, that is pulling apart, um, this second book, uh, the essay in Introduction into the Christian theory of art is an attempt to put it back together again. Uh, we've not yet published it um, in English. Um, we've got a draft translation. I'm not sure, frankly, whether we're ever going to find a publisher for it because there's a 300 page book, some publishers are, uh, are not very willing unless you basically pay them to do it. Uh, so possibly we might, we're thinking about putting it on the web in one form or another. Um, I guess that's most of it from my side. Um, I mean, say, right. Also, I, I, I guess one thing which has influenced me is that I, I do a lot of work. And as a, I've worked as a translator for 30 years. A lot of my work is with the um, museums, particularly with the um, Royal Museums of Fine Arts in Belgium, which has a superb collection of Flemish primitive. And I, over the years, have translated almost everything on them. And from this experience, I'm very conscious that um, of what good Christian art is, and very much how I can paint them is just part of a wider scheme. Okay. Uh, the program is the uh, theology of art and uh, the uh, theory of art are two separate. And so my, my wife is whispering at me. She, she, <laughs> she, she, she's sort of, she, she, she's saying that basically the theology of art and the theory of the art. Theology of icon and theory of art are two different. The yeah, if you hear it from the back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the theology of the icons and the theory of art are basically two different things. And um, if you start to mix them up without being really competent, 
you get a mess. Um, and we spent an awful lot of time basically undoing a mess, clearing up afterward. Paradoxically, right now in the Russian church, I would say that icon painting is one of the very few areas where there is any real creativity at all. Fortunately, it stays rather apart from hierarchic supervision. Um, icon painters, you, you, it's very difficult to keep them under control. Mm. Um, whereas, as you probably know, the Russian church at the moment is, is in this sort of rather nervous state, um, very restrictive on what people say. Um, and icon painting is really one of the only places where there is a bit of fresh air and movement right at the moment. I think those last uh, phrases are, are uh, something I will deploy to sort of conclude our, our conversation. The uh, comment on the um, theory of art and the theology of icons uh, and then that finally um, that uh, notion of, of um, sort of there being some uh, movement in, in terms of uh, iconography. Uh, I think that that'll be uh, an ideal sort of close. So 